Quick. Hi everyone, we're just going to give people a few more minutes um, to come in and then we'll get started. Right, looks like we're at 30 people, so I say we can get started from here. So welcome everyone. This is the sixth session of our Western Mass Housing Conference series. This is titled uh, Abandon, uh, Addressing Abandoned and Distressed Properties. Um, I'll have Katie give a uh, introduction and a little bit about who um, we are, MHP, but just as a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you uh, will be recording the um, session today, you probably got a notification that this is being recorded and we post them onto our housing toolbox website in the resources section. So if you ever wanna access this later, that will be there. We'll be sending out the, and you can also see any of the previous sessions if you weren't able to uh, make them. Um, we'll, we will be sending out the presentations um, after, so you can, so if for, for your reference, you'll have um, our presenters uh, contact information. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to say that we will be doing uh, questions at the end of each presentation. So we have three presentations. Uh, my colleague, Katie Lacey, will be watching the chat and um, be fielding those. So please um, put your thoughts there, put any questions, and we'll hopefully have a great discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to Katie. Good morning. Um, we've had a high level of interest in this series, and I'm sure it's just because this is such a big issue in Western Mass. Um, this actually emerged in the regional in the Rural Policy Advisory Committee as, as a top issue that the mechanisms for um, improving distressed housing is are, are so challenging. So I'll just tell you a little bit about MHP. Um, I'm waiting for Katie to get us to the next screen. Yeah, so this is who we are. If you've been in this series, you see we, we work with communities to create policies to provide affordable homes and better lives for the people of Massachusetts, including supply, increasing the supply of affordable housing and that also includes rehabilitating existing buildings. And we work closely with municipalities to demonstrate new and better ways of meeting our affordable housing needs. Um, so I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over fairly quickly. We have a real pro, Don Bianchi, who is the senior policy advocate at um, um, MACPC or Mass Association of the MACDC, excuse me, Mass Association of Community Development Corporations, um, who lives in Northamp Northampton and basically put this whole presentation together. So I'm just gonna turn it right over to Don at this point. Thank you, Katie. Um, and as Katie said, my name's Don Bianchi. I'm with the Mass Association of CDCs. Um, one correction, I would just say that um, it, the three of us put this together, um, uh, uh, Maya and Michael and myself. Um, and, and in that light, I'm pleased to be joined by these two terrific presenters who represent organizations that have successfully addressed the problems associated with vacant and distressed properties. Our workshop will highlight three approaches to addressing these problems. First, the Attorney General's Neighborhood Renewal Division's use of the enforcement authority of the State Sanitary Code 
to turn abandoned residential properties around. And that will be presented by Maya Kizmirchik, of, who is an assistant attorney general with the Neighborhood Renewal Division of the Attorney General's Office in Massachusetts. Um, then One Holyoke CDC's experience as a receiver in Holyoke, which brought, brings a community development and nonprofit housing perspective to abandoned properties, will be presented by Michael Moriarty, who is the executive director of One Holyoke CDC. And third, I will describe the Neighborhood Stabilization Initiative a multifaceted approach to addressing vacant and distressed properties in weak market neighborhoods and communities statewide. Um, and I thank you all for participating in this workshop. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Maya. Hello everyone, I, like Don said, I am Maya from the Attorney General's office. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Um, so just before we get started, uh, just a quick legal disclaimer. This is a brief synopsis. It's provided for introductory informational purposes only. It is not legal advice and should not be construed as an attempt to provide a legal opinion about any of the matters discussed here. Okay, um, so I do wanna quickly say that this is a sort of a slice of a much larger presentation that takes about 45 minutes. So I'm just gonna try to get um, hit the, the uh, most important points. Um, and of course, there'll be um, time for questions at the end and um, my contact information is provided at the end. So anybody can feel free to reach out to me if you have um, more questions or want to discuss anything that um, we discuss in here any further. Um, so the Neighborhood Renewal Division actually just recently transformed from the Abandoned Housing Initiative. Um, and while we're still trying to um, grow and trying to take on other challenges that we see in our communities, we still want to ensure safer neighborhoods through blight reduction and the creation of safe, habitable homes. Um, that's still one of our main focuses. We also want to provide code enforcement assistance to partner municipalities across the Commonwealth to help eliminate the presence of vacant properties in blighted condition. And where appropriate, we'll go ahead and petition local courts to appoint independent third parties called receivers to help care, maintain, and rehab the properties that are distressed. Um, additionally, whether it's through informal resolution with stakeholders, owners, or lenders, or through litigation, our goal is still at the end of the day is to return neglected properties back into housing and productive use. Here's just sort of a little snapshot of um, most of the partners that we have um, in the community here. It's sort of ever changing and evolving, um, but our origins sort of stem back from all the way to 1995 with the Abandoned Housing Task Force. It stemmed out of the Attorney General's Office Safe Neighborhood Initiative in Fields Corner of Dorchester, where the city of Boston had identified 100 abandoned properties. Mm -hmm. The Attorney General's Office then launched the pilot, pilot programs in Boston and Springfield, where we guided and consulted municipalities in bringing properties, where basically nobody was taking responsibility for the abandoned properties, um, for the care and maintenance of the properties. Um, this initial task force actually started with volunteers from across the office, so we didn't have a set initiative or a division at this point. Um, but then in 2008, we had the foreclosure crisis and we, that's when our abandoned housing initiative um, sort of formalized within the trial division in our office. We were working off a grant from the neighborhood stabilization program of about $235,000. Um, and then we sort of grew from that. This also map also shows our offices. We have our Boston office, it's a little bit different now because we're mainly working remotely, but in our Boston office, our chief sits with an attorney and our program manager. We have three attorneys in New Bedford, two in Worcester, and I sit in the Springfield office. Um, and this is just a quick little, um, another snapshot of our program. We have about 147 municipal partners from across the Commonwealth. 
we have just over 330 active properties currently. Out of those properties, we have just over 85 cases in active litigation. And then for the fiscal year of 2019, we've helped recover um, just over $725,000 in back taxes to municipalities. And just going back briefly to the cases in active litigation, as you can see, not all our active properties are in active litigation. And that's just because it varies by case by case. A lot of times we can get resolutions before bringing a case to court. Um, and we don't always want to bring active uh, cases, uh, just only really where it's appropriate. And this is our, our flow chart here. So I usually spend a lot of time on this chart and there's a lot of information here. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go through it a little bit quickly, but sort of step-by-step. Step. It this definitely is a good representation of our receivership process. And we do get authority from the state sanitary code to go ahead and go through this process and bring cases into court. Um, so first, a municipality always will identify a distressed property they want to refer to our program. Um, and not every property is appropriate. So we'll discuss uh, the issues the property is facing. Um, we'll go ahead and do a site visit inspection for a little bit. Um, a little bit different now, but we still do go on site visits and inspections. Normally we'd like somebody from the town there, but at this day and age, we understand that's not always possible. Um, I actually have been to Beckett not that long ago and actually have to go back to check on a few properties and then also check on a property in Windsor. Um, so I'm planning on doing that um, hopefully sometime soon. So once we do the site visit and inspection, I actually take a look at the condition of the property, we'll go ahead and do a title search and identify any owners or any mortgage companies or anybody who has interest property a judgment lien holder. Um, and at this point, we'll see if it's um, appropriate for our program. We also will go ahead and um, have potential receivers take a look at the property as well, just to see if it's something that they want to take on. Not every property is, you know, best fit for every receiver. So we wanna make sure that people have options. Uh, once kind of all that happens, we'll go ahead and send notice to the owners and any parties that have an interest in the property or any potential heirs. And that's in the form of a demand letter. And then sort of we kind of have at this point, two types of owners, cooperative and uncooperative. And a cooperative owner can definitely turn into an uncooperative owner um, sort of many times during the process. Um, but if we have an owner that goes, goes ahead and gives us a call, um, we discuss the issues with that owner. Um, I will go ahead and ask them, you know, what's your plan here? Um, and we'll discuss a plan with a timeline. Usually I ask the owners to go ahead and send something to me in writing. It doesn't have to be fancy. A lot of times it's an estimate or a contract from a contractor uh, outlining what they're gonna do. And at this point, the owner also has to be in touch with the town, pulling permits and um, discussing in more detail what the actual code violations are. We'll go ahead and monitor the situation. Also, sometimes, too, we might have an owner who wants to go ahead and sell the property. So we'll, we'll go ahead and let that happen. Also monitor the case and make sure that the new owner is um, fully aware of the situation and um, corrects the code violations. And then Ultimately, we hoped we get to that bottom peachy box where the property is back in compliance with the state sanitary code, no longer a threat to the public health and safety or to property values and get it back on the municipality tax rolls. If we have an uncooperative owner um, or a cooperative owner turns into an uncooperative owner, well, just a quick note here, actually during COVID, I've actually had so much more owner response than I had previously, um, which is which is great, um, but if we do have an uncooperative owner, we'll go ahead and prepare affidavits, petitions, motions, get that filed with the court and serve the owner and any party as an interest. The affidavits also include an affidavit from somebody from the town, usually a health agent who has um, the knowledge and the background information of the property. And then once that's all filed, we'll go ahead and ask the court to appoint a receiver to take, um, control of the property and work from there. At this point, there's 
it's a court monitor process with a receiver and our office reports to the court sort of on progress. There's receivers, receivers reports that need to be filed. The court reviews those, our office reviews those. There's orders, there's motions um, and sort of report back to the court sort of on a step-by-step -step process of what's going on. And then once the property is brought back, back up to code, the town okays it. Usually the receiver asks for the property to be sold and um, the case usually gets closed at that point. So this is just a um, great diagram of paying off the receivership and sort of property value of the property or market value of the property, excuse me. So a receiver, in order to be able to do what they do, they have a lien that goes on the property. This lien is a super priority lien that um, takes priority over everything except for municipal taxes and municipal tax or municipal liens. As you can see on the bottom of the little house, um, that gets paid off first in the red unpaid property taxes. The next portion that gets paid off once the property is sold is the receiver's lien, and that takes up a majority of the market value. And then um, there are times when there is a surplus. Most of the time it goes back to the mortgage company because there's usually a mortgage, but there are times when it goes back to uh, the owner or some funds are, are going back to the owner. In the receiver's lien, there can be included anything from labor, administrative fees, legal fees, um, parts labor, and that's all put in the receiver's report and there's a tally and, and that once again gets reviewed by the court. Um, so once the property is completed, the receiver will ask the court to go ahead and be able to sell the property off at auction or sometimes it's placed on MLS. Um, recently, we've had quite a bit of property sell faster um, than normal. And we've actually had, um, I've had a property where there was quite a lot of interest at the auction. A lot of times the receiver does purchase the property back at an auction. And it just depends on uh, what the receiver's preference is. Um, sometimes the bank um, has a preference and then Usually it's what the court has preferences on how the property is, is sold. And then in order to be appointed a receiver, there is a court receiver list. And then our office does have a pool as well. And to apply for our uh, receivership process, there's a questionnaire online. It's only a few pages. It gets submitted to our office, review it. We'll go ahead and do a background check. And then usually there's an interview um, with usually um, the uh, assistant attorney general that's in the, the area that the receiver applied to be a receiver in. Um, usually those were done in person, um, but clearly we can do those virtually now. And realistically, anyone can be a receiver who demonstrates the ability and experience in rehabbing distressed properties, can make a good potential receiver. We've had for-profits, not-for-profits, construction companies of all different sizes. We've had attorneys and we've had community groups who are receivers. And we're always looking for new receivers, especially um, in the Berkshires, because we do want to make sure that um, we're reaching that area. And um, we're just always looking for receivers because they get busy, they can't handle every project. So we just want to make sure that we have sort of a wide net here. And then I just want to now focus on a, a couple of our results. And um, this is a street located in Brockton. And I just think this is a good example of how sort of a street kind of came back to life. A receiver here did three properties on the street, two next to each other, and I think one is the next house down. And I just think it's just a great example of um, the program and just sort of how we can have a receiver um, work in one area as well. And then um, the next few properties I have here um, are sort of in um, smaller towns. And, you know, I'm from a small town. I then I, I was raised in a, a slightly bigger town of about 2300 people. Um, so I, I get it. I mean, towns and cities are different. Each municipality is different. So I can recognize that. Um, additionally, um, we also know that um, there's places where town employees are doing multiple jobs, working part-time, where health agents are covering multiple towns. And so uh, we completely understand that. And this property in Beckett 2442 Main Street, I believe the receiver actually might be um, in the workshop. This is a property that is in the progress 
of um, being completed. It's under receivership right now. And the goal here is to go ahead and um, have this property, I believe, turned into affordable housing. So as you can see here, there's lots of debris in the yard, the house is missing siding, there's an abandoned car, and the inside doesn't look that great as well. We basically gutted, but not in a good way. Um, and there's also a lot of debris there. And um, while this might be maybe a little bit dated per, per, per picture, I think that um, the receiver has done much more progress. But however, you can already see here, we've got new siding, we have um, new windows, the inside a little, looking a little fuzzy on the, on the right hand side there, but that's just because it's a picture through a window. As you can see, the framing um, looks great and the debris is, is cleaned up from the inside. This next property is 132 L Street in Montague. So this is also just a good example of how um, the process might not be, you know, might not happen overnight. Um, here we had a rather large building of eight units and um, it took the receiver about three years to complete and the total cost was about half a million dollars. The property had sat vacant for six years before it was placed in receivership. And here, this was located sort of in the center of town. It was definitely a priority for the town to get rehabbed. And um, I believe the receiver actually purchased this property at auction. I think he also had complete, has completed three properties on the street additionally as well. And one of the properties with court's approval and with um, the town's approval, he was able to actually rent out a unit while he was rehabbing the rest of the property and he's rented out most of these units. And the late main on the overgrown uh, there's lots today and then in the picture on the side here on the right, as you can see, I think there used to be a porch right there. Um, and um, as you can see, there's, there's structural issues there. And then we've got a driveway and the driveway actually was a big deal here because there wasn't one. And we wanted to make sure there was one because this is also right in the middle of town. Um, so we got a driveway, the house is complete. It was placed on MLS and it sold within about a week. And currently we're just waiting for the closing to happen and to get final approval for, from the court to go ahead and um, disperse funds and, and close, the, close the case down. Um, and whoever took that picture on the right did a great job because the lighting is perfect. And just quickly, we do have grants. Um, they change, um, they're ever evolving. The one that we do currently have now is a receivership fund where receivers can get up to $75,000 in loans with low or no interest and a potential for a subsidy. It's administrated through the Chelsea Restoration Corporation and the Fall River Community Development Corporation. And there's more information on our website about that grant. And then just here's my contact information. So hopefully I didn't talk too long. We did have a couple quick questions. That was such a great presentation. I've never really understood that process. That was like lightning. Um, one, the receiver did say that she is here, June Wolf, or maybe knows it, the receiver's here, and it says it looks much better. So I don't know if we have time afterwards, if um, the receiver wants to talk a little bit about the experience. And yeah, I didn't want to like put her on the spot or anything, so. June, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, sure, uh, I think it's a great process. Um, it's the court really works, the attorney general's um, office and the court really worked with us uh, very closely um, and it's a wonderful way to do affordable housing. We also did some, um, I did some grant writing. So we got CPA funds in it, small town housing initiative funds in it. Um, and that really helps because it doesn't matter if you're doing it as affordable, it doesn't cost any less. And so, um, and this particular house was really bare bones. Um, we, we had to do everything. Uh, so, um, it was hard, but it was good. And the town of Beckett, um, very cooperative. They really wanted to see this happen. It's, 
it's like turning the whole affordable process housing process on its head the neighbors love it the town <laughs> loves it there's no nimbyism you know because you're you're putting this uh, awful looking property back on the tax rolls so um you know we went to town meeting and almost everybody was just so grateful um, yeah. that we were doing it so that was kind of cool um and somebody asked about the building code uh the building code it was a big part of this in fact it was the um it was the building inspector who right who reached out to maya isn't that true uh so i think it was uh the health agent who he oh, actually was. covers okay. a bunch of towns okay well it was a building inspector who called us so um yeah and there they you really have to work very closely with them um but so far so good we're we're not quite finished. I don't know if we'll get a septic in uh, before winter because um, it's Beckett and it's all ledge, but we'll get it eventually. Um, we just got one more question. We probably do need to move on, but I, I think this is going to be a, um, is the program, are, are only municipalities eligible to apply or can a community group initiate this process or a property owner say? So normally we take referrals directly from the municipality. Um, it doesn't mean that people can't contact our office, um, but usually the referral is through the municipality. Yeah. And then just a, a couple questions about funding and my question too. So in summary, what you're saying is that once the you're on the list of receivers, but and you guys do all the legwork, but the, the cash for actually the rehab initially comes from the receiver. And Correct. there's loans available, there's CPA, as it sounds like June was able to access. Um, but that, that, so that's sort of the tricky part is getting the cash together before. I, I have to say, we had a really hard time with the loan. Uh, we never actually we, we got all the closing documents and everything done for that and then never got the check <laughs> so um that was not good uh but we were able like i said to get these other funds um by cooperating with the town so uh we got what we needed terrific well we should probably move on but that was just great so thank you I'll just stop sharing my screen. Thank you. And like I said, anybody can reach out to us if they have any questions or anything. So Don, I don't know if you wanna go ahead and introduce, oh, here we go. Don, yay. Yeah, so so um, I, I introduced, I gave a brief bio from before, but this is Michael Moriarty from Unholy CDC to tell us about their on the ground experience. So. Hopefully, is, is the screen share? Uh... Yeah, I can see it. So uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm experiencing minor technical difficulties. I hope I can be heard and seen OK. Uh, Don, if you can give me a thumbs up, because I'm seeing you on the screen. Perfect. OK. Uh, yeah, so I'm Mike Moriarty. I'm the executive director of One Hoyo Community Development Corporation. Uh, we made a decision to apply to the uh, Springfield Housing Court and become a receiver about six years ago. And we average about one receivership a year since we uh, engaged that way. Uh, Don, if you could go ahead to the next screen. Um, and it, it's very much a, um, it's very much a mission driven uh, choice that we made. Uh, our legacy uh, as a 50 year old organization is in creating affordable home ownership in the city of Holyoke. We've infilled over 160 different locations over the years. But in 2008, when the home partnership investment funding uh, at the federal level uh, was cut in half, it became massively more competitive and uh, less available. And that had been our primary resource for delivering duplexes that we would sell to families. And we had to get creative to find more ways to continue to deliver affordable home ownership. And receivership looked like a way to get it done. And in its own very fussy, very wonky kind of way, it has worked out for us pretty well. Uh, in terms of making the case for why a mission-driven um, housing-oriented nonprofit would want to do this work, um, I would recommend to anybody who's not familiar with it to uh, Google the Center for Community Progress 
look at a lot of their written materials about the impact that abandoned and vacant properties have on people who live in a neighborhood. Uh, look at uh, you know the different ways that different communities have to fight for solutions because there really isn't a market-based answer for this kind of work. And then when you look at our mission, which is in the smaller print in that orange box, you'll see that that is completely aimed at the center of our mission, turning around that vacant and abandoned place that kids in our neighborhoods have to walk past every day to get to school is at the heart of why we even exist. So uh, that, made, um, that made receiverships look like a really attractive thing to try. Uh, if you could jump to the next one, Don. Um, so we also have to be responsible stewards of our resources. And uh, so, you know, we look at that triple bottom line uh, kind of mindset. Uh, one thing that you will learn if you go to a receivership training, and if you sign up and you get on the receivership list for the Western Division Housing Court, you will need to appear at a training that they do annually, which is extremely helpful. You'll meet a lot of practitioners. You'll meet a lot of attorneys who were involved in the work. By the way, you don't do this work without having an attorney with you. Uh, I, I actually happened to be an attorney in a prior life, and uh, that's not good enough. I have to have an actively practicing counsel involved in this. And it's a small pool of people who have a lot of experience with this stuff because it is detailed and it's complex and, and you really need them with you. Uh, never accept a receivership if you can't afford to own the property when you're done. I think that's a really important uh, rule of thumb that was given at that training and that we have followed with a great deal of care uh, ever since. We do have access to a revolving fund and a pool of pre-development money uh, that we have used many times for this work. Uh, also, we are structured in a way where our maintenance team of about seven people with a licensed general contractor can use the additional work that I can charge back to this project. That actually helps us out a great deal and is acceptable. Uh, and what we found is when we put our budget together and ask the court to approve it, when we bake in about a 15% development fee, uh, and it's not always shown that way, there's a lot of different kinds of structures for how these things are paid for, uh, but that has been accepted and it's even been accepted over the objection of mortgage holders and owners who are looking at every line item we submit to say, you don't have to do and shouldn't do one thing more than the bare minimum to bring this up to code. Uh, that, that's kind of the standard for the receivership. Uh, but for us, we can't do this and not cover our, um, our overhead just like everybody else. And so the courts understand that and the uh, council for the towns understand that and it gets approved. Um, again, it, it is really a mission-based activity. And so if I can't relate the work we're doing to our mission, I'm not gonna do it. That, that's, I think, an important part of a nonprofit ethic. And then finally, uh, what we are doing is keeping the entire contents of an abandoned house out of a landfill more often than not. Um, and uh, within very small limits, uh, we do have the ability to, uh, you know, do a little bit of deconstruction, a little bit of repurposing. Uh, we can follow those sort of sustainable practices in a way uh, that if there was somebody who just wanted the building for a lot, uh, they might not otherwise be inclined to do. I will say one challenge of working in Holyoke, we're a small gateway city. We have had for generations now an extremely depressed residential market. The problem with creating new housing is always that it is no cheaper than anywhere else to build a new house or to do a full gut rehab on an existing building, but you're never going to get the sales price and you're never going to get the rent on the other side of it. So there's got to be some level of, um, there's got to be some level of, uh, um, uh, my words are failing me, uh, support from uh, the public sphere. Uh, in order to make these work. Don, we can jump to the next one, please. So there are a lot of challenges because this is really difficult work. It is financially risky. It may be that when you're done with your project, you are going to end up owning a place that you're badly underwater. So you, you have to know that when you go in, 
if you get in early and submit a budget and find out it's not sustainable, our experience, and we've availed ourselves of this, is the court will let you out and go find another receiver if they can. Uh, there's a large pool of receivers. Most of them are not nonprofits. I know of very few other CDCs that have uh, engaged in this work. Um, and most of that is because of the level of financial risk. You cannot control the outcome of these. Um, again, it requires subsidies. These are not ready for subsidies. The house is available. It's already been on the city or the attorney general's radar screen for a long time. When they do uh, outreach for a receiver, they want somebody who's gonna say, I'll do it now that has the capital available to get the work processed almost immediately. Uh, that's not how subsidy driven housing works. And so you have to have a contingency plan for that. Uh, nonetheless, we've been able to use AFI funding. We've been able to use CDGB funding. Um, you know, it's also the benefit of being a small CDC that's based in one community only. We already have very close relationships with the people who provide these means. And that can make a big difference if you're trying to do something the city recognizes is really helpful and you're trying to do it in a hurry, but you're taking a lot of risk. Um, this is a highly, highly regulated area rooted in litigation. So the court is overseeing everything you're doing. Opposing counsel and banks are overseeing everything you're doing. You take something like CDGB money, there's a world of regulatory requirements behind that. And so, um, you know, it, it, it is not for the novice and it's not for the faint of heart. I, I, I would just say that. Uh, and then finally, we do this because our ultimate goal is that this rehabilitated house is going to be put into the hands of an owner occupant and um, done in a way that doesn't cause us any dire financial harm. Uh, and the reward is we've been able to achieve that, but not all the time. As often as not, the bank just pays us for our work and thanks us. Um, we also are a really fussy potential receiver. If, some, if the municipality came and said, I've got this 30 unit abandoned building and we got plenty of them in Holyoke, uh, we'd pass on that every time, especially if it was occupied. The property management side of that would just be absolutely ruinous to our normal operations. Even if it's abandoned, that kind of scale, we don't have that kind of money laying around. But a one or two family home ideally, but not necessarily always vacant, that we can manage. And so that's what we're willing to accept. We try to avoid full gut rehabs. We're always much happier to see a place that is not occupied, but not so far out of code compliance that you can't work with most of the bones that are already there. And that's typically what we've received. Uh, but if you're gonna be fussy like that, you're not gonna be doing this at any large scale. You're going to be doing one a year if you're lucky. Uh, ready for the next one. Okay, so these are uh, some of the properties that we have done uh, in Holyoke. Uh, Beacon Avenue was the first one we did. The bank bought it back, but we were very happy to see that not long afterwards, this property that had been abandoned for a relatively short time was sold uh, through the market to an owner occupant. Uh, no subsidy, it wasn't an affordable owner occupant. This is kind of a cusp neighborhood in Holyoke, uh, but that's what we're hoping to achieve. And uh, Ely Street in Holyoke, uh, right next to our office as it happened. And we built that house back in the 80s, uh, but it had been abandoned. Uh, we actually made a lot of noise with the city saying, oh my God, one of the houses we built next to our office is abandoned, do something about this. Over time with a on and off cooperative owner, uh, we did get put in as a receiver. In the end, the bank was able to prevail on having us removed as receiver, promising they'd be able to revive it and get it into home ownership at a lower cost to them. Uh, and you know what? That push was what was necessary and it is in the hands of a homeowner right now and the house is back up to code. That's what we want. Uh, Lincoln Avenue, uh, it's actually should be Lincoln Street. Uh, that one was um, occupied at the time. A terrible amount of distress. We had to uh, remove a... Uh, non-paying tenant who was really aggressive and actually uh, kind of overbearing on the poor soul who owned the place that lived next door. Uh, we took a long time to get this one done. Uh, and in, mainly all we had to do is replace a boiler and a roof. Uh, and the bank ultimately paid us for that. And even with the bank, that person did not get displaced until 
maybe a year and a half after we had finished our role in the receivership. Our goal was to work around this uh, as a CDC. We never want to replace, displace somebody who's got a roof over our head. That's, that's the opposite of what we're here for. Um, but strangely, the bank still owns it to this day. It's been vacant for almost two years. I drive by it almost every day coming from the stop and shop that I go to. And it's just a crazy outcome because if they had just not bid at the auction and had us own it, there would be a family and probably um, a first time home buyer uh, living in there with a tenant. And so that's where I say, you cannot direct the outcome. You can just do the best possible with the circumstances receiverships allow. Lyman Street is a non-rehabitable house. I'm gonna show a little bit more detail about what you can end up walking into uh, in, in the next couple of slides. But then finally, uh, kind of the one we're most proud of is 140 Beach Street. That was abandoned for 10 years. It experienced a fire. It had been squatted in for a long time. The first step we had to do was get a um, substance abuse agency called Tapestry in to remove the over 100 abandoned needles that were all over the floors in the place. I wasn't going to put my working crew at risk that way. Um, but it's an 1870s house. My guys recrafted some incredibly minute woodworking detail and some stained glass that was embedded in the place. And a family bought it with CDGB money. It was just a, a tremendous outcome. And that, that's what we do it for. And that's why we would be interested in continuing doing this work. Um, the scope of the work. So this is Lyman Street. A guy died who owned the place. Um, and there was no family around and nobody did anything. And it's been about eight years now. Um, and you can see what an unheated, abandoned place that gets broken into looks like when you first walk into it. Um, and unfortunately, it is structurally unsound and it's on a lot that it's only got 20 feet of frontage. So it's not even buildable after it's gone. Um, and so uh, at the end of the day, that's a teardown. And, uh, but this is what our crew could do in the space of about a week to just at least make the interior less dangerous and more secure. So that's, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the hands-on outcomes that you see. Wow. Um, so um, one of the things is when I wrote this back in March, I anticipated that house would be gone by now. COVID's had a tremendous effect on a small development organization, a small development organization's capacity to actually develop. There was so much street work in Holyoke. It took me almost eight weeks to get an excavator to cut off the sewer line uh, that we needed to do. And actually that may be coming down next week. Um, so that's, and that, that's the one that we're on right now. Uh, we do have, uh, oh, Don, if you could just jump to the next one. We, we do have a goal that's, um, that's uh, beyond financial with this. And uh, yeah, it's the one with the, that says public notice on it, please, Don. So, and that is, we can lose some money because you know that this work is going out in our uh, donation solicitations every year. And a teardown one time resulted in an unsolicited $20,000 donation to this organization, which said to me, even though we have to pay for this ourselves and uh, actually the court and the parties don't necessarily like it, I will always stick up a great big sign to make sure the people in the neighborhood know exactly who's doing this work and that it's being done. Uh, because that's a very powerful um, tool for our good work, our, our goodwill and our community outreach, um, which sometimes um, in the long haul has monetary value, even if we lose money in the short term. Uh, in this case, we will lose money. We're going to end up holding an unbuildable lot. And, uh, you know, between the donation and some help with the AFI program, we'll probably uh, have $15,000 we're unlikely to recoup. But at the end of the day, sometimes that's how you apply your resources to carry out your mission. And with that done, uh, I think we're all done. Great, we did, we have one question that just came in, usually there's more when, when we get going. Do you use Holyoke firms for construction and the trades and such exclusively? Uh, exclusively would be going a little bit too far for some specialized work sometimes. But just as we would do with CDGB or homework, we follow section three lists that we have maintained. And, uh, you know, we've been around for 50 years. So we 
rarely uh, don't hire locally owned small businesses. And um, uh, when we do, it's because, you know, it's, it's some sort of, uh, uh, you know, siding issue or um, other kind of, I'm trying, I think that's the only time uh, we had something kind of unique and we had a order out to reduce the cost by many thousands of dollars. Uh, as a general rule, hiring local is baked in our DNA. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna take advantage of my position to ask one question now that we have Maya here, the decider, and you, Michael. Um, I'm curious what the factors are that the um, Attorney General's office looks at when they decide something is a good candidate for receivership and does it have to do with having a, a willing partner that's ready to go? Yes, so normally the property, one of the big factors has to be abandoned. And I think one of the things I didn't mention was that um, there has to be a balance. We have to have a receiver. Somebody has to be willing to take it on. And then there has to be a balance for them too. Of There has to be some code violations that makes it a hazard or you know a priority for the town. And, but there has to be a balance with being able to be able to repair it and where um, the receiver won't be in the red. Um, so that's why sometimes we talk to multiple receivers about properties and taking a look at them. Um, and sometimes um, there's properties like if they're a fire completely destroyed a property, that's probably something that we're not gonna be able to um, take on. And then sometimes, um, you know, it's case by case and things work out certain different ways. We might take a property that we might not be able to find a receiver on. Just a couple examples there. I, I can tell you too, it's not only the Attorney General's office. So the city of Holyoke initiates its own receiverships. Springfield's got a very active uh, program and is, uh, you know, really one of the stronger communities in this field in the state. And so uh, you have to have a link to your uh, local um, uh, city solicitor's office if they have that in place too. And, um, you know, I have to beg for forgiveness often because we turn down many more than we're willing to accept. We're a very specific kind of niche operator in this space. Uh, the one we've got now that we're tearing down uh, actually was an attorney general's one. And uh, the, the, the person working in the office uh, was pleading up and down and she had been working in Holyoke before. Um, and I said, fine, but you owe me big. And I hope you remember this. And then she left the attorney general's office. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of the way it goes. All right. Sorry, I muted myself. Thank you very much for that. That was um, really, really informative and interesting. So are you all, is everybody see my screen? Yes, and hear me? Okay, yep. thank you. Uh, Don, I'm Don Bianchi again with MACDC. And, and before I launch into this, I very quickly want to acknowledge that I dropped the ball on something, um, which is I bugged Maya and Michael several times to send me a brief bio. They did, and then I promptly forgot to tell you who they are. So I'm just going to take a minute to quickly say uh, a, a little bit about them because they're both so accomplished and knowledgeable. So Maya Kizmirchuk is the, uh, an assistant attorney general in the neighborhood renewal division of the state attorney general's office. That's formerly the abandoned housing initiative. She's been there since 2012 and has worked on consumer and housing issues. Obviously has a lot of expertise in the abandoned housing area. So um, very glad she could be part of this. And Michael Moriarty has been the executive director of One Holyoke CDC since 2013. And he talked extensively about what they're terrific mission is. And the only other thing I want to say about Michael is he's also spent a, his career fighting for early literacy success for all children and closing the achievement gap. And in fact, in 2015 was appointed by Governor Baker to serve at the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and, and Second Elementary and Secondary Education. So again, sorry for that omission, but I did want you to know um, how you know the a little bit of the background on the, the other presenters. And I would just say that um, I think that's a great pairing because, you know, the attorney general's office, their neighborhood renewal division has programs where if there's a problem property, 
a municipal official can con contact them. They can see if they can work with the owner. They can resort to a receivership when necessary. So please, please use Maya and the Attorney General's office as a resource. And then Michael is a great example of what a, an experienced conscientious receiver can do with a, you know, with challenging properties and, and, and a challenging process. So uh, many thanks to them both. I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about something that's sort of on the horizon. It's just kicked off. It's called the Neighborhood Stabilization Initiative, a tool for addressing distressed properties. And the challenge that, it, that we set out to address is the fact that many lower income neighborhoods in Massachusetts, primarily in gateway cities, and rural areas struggle with the challenges of weak real estate markets. Because of low rents and declining values, it makes it very difficult for owners to maintain this aging housing stock. Um, and abandoned and blighted properties, particularly those located in close proximity to occupied residences and businesses create a range of problems for the communities in which they are located. For example, vacancy rates are at or near 10% in several gateway cities including Pittsfield, Holyoke, and Springfield. And furthermore, we know that many small town centers also struggle with weak markets and vacancy. So the Neighborhood Stabilization Initiative is a multifaceted approach for addressing vacant and distressed properties in weak markets, communities statewide, uh, and it aims to link local neighborhood efforts to state partners and to resources. The origins were, uh, it's a couple years ago, uh, MACDC, my organization, and Mass Inc. convened about two dozen leaders statewide for conversations on how to address the challenges faced by weak market neighborhoods. We explored a range of revitalization strategies to address the social, economic, and physical challenges that blight inflicts on neighborhoods, on both the places and its people. And from that, uh, we laid out a blueprint. There was a report uh, that was published uh, uh, that was written by Alan Malik for the Center for Community Progress, Michael referred to them, uh, and Ben Foreman from Mass Inc. Um, and uh, Alan and Ben both are extremely knowledgeable about these issues. The name of the report that was issued in January of 2019 is called Building Communities of Promise and Possibility, State and Local Blueprints for Comprehensive Neighborhood Stabilization. Um, and certainly we have that available for folks who wanna see the report. And it identified local and statewide strategies, legislative strategies, administrative strategies, and budget strategies for addressing neighborhood stabilization needs. Uh, then uh, Representative Cabral and Senator Crichton filed legislation. This was in January of 2019, called an act relative to neighborhood stabilization and economic development that had four components. The first was an increase in the Housing Development Incentive Program, or HDIP, uh, to raise its annual cap from 10 million to 20 million to spur the development of market rate housing in gateway cities. Second, to establish within the Office of Executive Office, excuse me, of Housing and Economic Development, a capacity building initiative to assist cities and towns to initiate neighborhood stabilization programs and practices in their locality. Third, establishment of a spot blight rehabilitation program to allow for the use of eminent domain in certain circumstances for acquisition of small vacant properties. And fourth, establishment of a commission to study building codes and address the current inequity impacting the rehab of buildings in weak markets. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of these. Capacity building. Uh, in the state fiscal 2020 budget, uh, the budget includes 750,000 for a neighborhood stabilization initiative to assist local governments and their nonprofit partners to implement strategic neighborhood stabilization initiatives. Um, the language states that it shall be developed in consultation with MACDC and Mass Inc. and shall focus on identifying and implementing strategies for reclaiming vacant, abandoned and blighted properties and on capacity building at the local level. Uh, What's really exciting is that from that, um, we all worked, we and, I'll, uh, and others, which who I'll mention in a minute, uh, worked together to establish the Neighborhood Stabilization Hub. With these 750,000 in state funds, the Neighborhood Hub was formed. It's a multi-agency partnership staffed and administered by Mass Housing and includes the following partners. Mass Housing, Mass Development, our host here, MHP, MACDC, 
the Department of Housing and Community Development, and the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. The primary goal of the Neighborhood Hub is to support cities with high rates of vacant, abandoned, and deteriorating homes, especially those facing increased strain due to the health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Initially, the hub is seeking to partner with three to five gateway cities and their nonprofit partners for two years and provide technical assistance grants of up to 100,000 each to support planning service, services and activities that foster neighborhood stabilization. So that work is underway and ongoing. Uh, uh, second piece, the spotlight legislation um, is still, has still not uh, been adopted. Uh, the reason that we need it is that the current eminent domain, domain statute, uh, uh, which can be a very useful tool in neighborhood stabilization, uh, consistent with the constitutional protections afforded property owners for acquiring title to a distressed property when the property owner is unwilling or unable to address blight. As I started to say, uh, the current eminent domain statute, which is chapter 121A, is intended to apply to one large project and is really not well suited for smaller projects. The proposed legislation would enable a project sponsor to pursue multiple smaller properties, clarify the role of the municipality vis-a-vis -vis DHCD and make other changes consistent with the smaller scale of the properties. And again, um, affording the, the uh, required protections to property owners. While it appears likely that this legislation and the broader bill filed in early 2019 will have to await enactment until next year, there are some promising news from the economic development bill that's currently before the legislature and more on that in a minute. Uh, the, the last thing I'll just mention again, this is not going to be enacted this year, but the current uh, market, excuse me, the current Massachusetts Architectural Access Board or AAB regulations set dollar thresholds either 100,000 or 500,000, depending upon the scope of rehabilitation that dictate whether rehab will trigger full compliance with AAB regulations. However, irrespective of the above dollar thresholds, if the work performed amounts to 30% or more of the value of the building, the entire building is required to fully comply with the AAB regulations. Therefore, rehab of, the rehab of a building in a weak market area is more likely than the rehab of a comparable building in comparable condition in a stronger market to exceed this 30% threshold and thus require full AAB compliance. The bill, if enacted, would establish a commission which would include a wide array of stakeholders to address the inequity in building codes. Now to the economic development bill, and this is really exciting. Um, in March, Governor Baker filed an economic development bill in, which included 25 million for neighborhood stabilization to help nonprofits, municipalities, and CDCs return blighted, blighted or vacant properties back to productive use. Again, the capacity building money that we already have and are administering through the neighborhood hub is going to help with the local capacity. We also need the rehab dollars. So this is essential. We are very happy to see that both the House and Senate passed economic development, that both House and Senate in the economic development legislation they passed included money for neighborhood stabilization, 40 million in the House and 50 million in the Senate, uh, with also explicit inclusion of weak markets and rural communities. As of today, the legislation is still in the House Senate Conference Committee. If enacted into law, actual spending depends on funding from the sale of bonds in the governor's capital budget. The legislation would only authorize, um, authorize the spending. So um, we would then Want, need to advocate with the governor to spend the money that's been authorized. And again, these funds can be used for the costs associated with acquiring and rehabilitating distressed properties. Um, Alan Malik of the Center for Community Progress, as I mentioned before, the author of the co-author of the report, which created a blueprint for this whole effort back in early 2019, published another paper in June of 2020. It describes how the myriad impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic will fall most heavily on struggling cities, lower income neighborhoods and communities of color. Alan presented his findings in a virtual event held by the Neighborhood Hub in September. It was a great event um, and perhaps uh, some of you actually attended that. But the impacts that Alan uh, outlined uh, 
that are uh, the problems that are exacerbated by COVID include high unemployment, unpaid rent leading to evictions and foreclosures, small business closings, and massive local and state budget shortfalls, which of course impact the condition of the housing in neighborhoods. And finally, I want to talk about the way forward. So um, the first thing, as I mentioned, is the Neighborhood Hub will solicit and review applications from Gateway Cities for its technical assistance funding. The process is underway. We will also advocate for passage uh, of the Economic Development Bill with the Neighborhood Stabilization Funding to cover the cost of rehab. If that happens, then we will advocate uh, with the administration and the governor to include funding in this capital budget. And finally, in the next legislative session, we will advocate for passage of comprehensive neighborhood stabilization legislation, including the spot blight provisions and a commission to address inequity in building codes. And we will continue to advocate in, this, in the state budget for additional funding for the neighborhood hub. So that's my presentation and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, we're, uh, thank you so much, Don, super useful. Um, Alyssa at FERCOG asked a question that I think is very much on everyone's mind, given that this is part of the Rural Housing Conference. Um, would the capacity be, you know, what are the implications of this for rural communities? And particularly someplace like Greenfield that's not actually, actually Greenfield is a gateway city, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> on but, that list. Um, but for rural areas, um, would there be capacity building funds available? You know, what, how would this apply to rural areas? That's a great question. Um, the, the, the funding in the state budget in the fiscal 2020 budget um, did not specify that it would be for gateway cities. However, uh, in its adoption, in its implementation, I should say, uh, it was mass housing administering it, the decision was made to focus on three to five gateway cities for this specific funding. How, however, uh, on the other side of things, we certainly, uh, our goal is to include funding for weak, is to include support for weak market areas in the other aspects of the legislation. So in um, funding for rehab, uh, in um, spotlight legislation. In fact, um, well, I won't go into that here, but um, that's our intention. And I think it's really important to keep that voice. Hopefully the Rural Policy Commission will help us make that case um, as well as individuals, uh, individual practitioners in rural areas. But uh, so I, on the, unfortunately on the capacity funding, this particular pot of money is just for gateway cities, but our intent is for the broader initiative to apply to weak market areas and rural areas as well as gateway cities. Yeah. And then um, another question on that, um, that I was curious about, which is that it looks to me like in the case of a gateway city, you're working with the municipal government, but in, a, in the case of a town where there may be a much smaller government infrastructure, who is your partner? Well, the, the applicants to the hub, and there were, there were a dozen applicants, and we, you know, we plan to select three to five for at least initially, uh, they really ranged in terms of capacity. And the other, one, of the, one of the key parts of the application was, who are your partners? And we definitely want to see strong local partners, uh, including CDCs, including other departments within the city, including other resources in the community. So uh, while the applicants are municipalities, um, we want to see them be part of a team. And I think the goal is also for to help municipalities, whether they be larger or smaller gateway cities, to build their capacity because even because um, we see that's important for the long term sustainability. Yeah. But what about for a rural town that's not a gateway city? Not you know, in terms of the, the logistics of the um, you know, property initiating this process. I think that um, I would encourage, I mean. I know that in some rural communities, um, they work with regional planning agencies, CDC, right. other nonprofits, sometimes small nonprofits, for, so, so for small for-profits, excuse me. Um, for example, there's a liabilities to assets program. It's called in North Central Quabbin region. Uh, there are five communities, including cities and uh, rural communities. 
that are working with New View communities with funding from DACD uh, in fact, to do something similar. In fact, we loosely modeled this on that effort. And I think the key for a community that does not have a lot of paid local capacity is to partner with folks and to partner with others, whether they be CDCs, regional planning agencies or others that have capacity. Because I think most communities, regardless of whether they're rural or urban, have local capacity. It just may not be in the form of paid municipal officials. Got it. And I will say also that MHP is always a great resource on these things. So I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Katie and Katie, but I think that you know, your municipal assistance division um, is a great resource on, on this and any, any related kind of program. Great. Well, um, I don't see any more questions unless there's some last minute ones, but that was a boatload of information. So I think we're probably going to wrap up, uh, Katie, if you want to wrap us out of here. Uh, but thank you everyone for coming and thank you so much for this amazing panel. Really a lot of info. Yes, yes. Thank you um, again. And we'll, since there's such great info, we'll definitely be sending out the um, slides later. So stay tuned for that. And um, we'll be posting the recording on the Housing Toolbox website. I did want to share that next Monday on November 9th is our last session for this series, this Western Mass Housing Conference series. Um, it will be on using uh, community development block grant funds for housing rehab. And it's going to be more of a panel discussion style. So Patricia Mullins from Berkshire Regional Planning Commission will be facilitating it with Doug Damaris at Hilltown CDC, Brian McHugh from Franklin County Regional Housing and Redevelopment Authority, Christopher uh, Dunphy at, and at uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. So it should be a really great discussion and we hope to see you then. So thanks everyone.